Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. Welcome to my channel if this is your first time here. I am in the middle of a big exploration of the original Twilight Zone, the original 156 episodes, and this is part four. So we're still in season one, and there's some awesome episodes in this little batch of six episodes. I'm taking each um, video as a batch of six episodes, and in the end I would have done 26 videos on this original series, the uh, original 1959-1964 series of The Twilight Zone. So uh, The Twilight Zone is an incredible show. One of the things that you're going to see in uh, a lot of the stories, it comes up a lot in the ones that Rod Serling writes, is references to war and man's capacity to wage war, the effects of war, and some of the kind of confusion and paranoia that comes from that. And that's true for this first episode, which is called the Purple Testament. OK, so the Purple Testament starts with this opening narration. Infantry platoon, US Army, Philippine Islands, 1945. These are the faces of the young men who fight, as if some omniscient painter had mixed a tube of oils that were at one time earth brown, dust grey, blood red, beard black and fear yellow white. And these men were the models. For this is the province of combat, and these are the faces of war. So Purple Testament, as I said, is written by Rod Serling, and it's basically got this lieutenant who can see basically the face of death in the people around him before they die. So he, he kind of starts noticing something weird about someone's face, and then shortly after that they'll die and uh they're sort of you know they're on the ground fighting and they you can see it in advance and it's freaking him out at first and then basically uh the episode takes that to its logical conclusion uh and uh and it's got quite a chilling ending so it's it's really good it's a really good episode it's quite a um, realistic episode in the sense that um, that's the only kind of fantastical thing in it, whereas a lot of time the Twilight Zone is doing something much more mysterious. But this is um, like a like an effect where they overexpose the lighting and someone's face will change and then this lieutenant will be like, that man's going to die, you know. Uh, but it's done really well and it's it's a really chilling episode. So, yeah, Purple Testament is a good one. That's the first one out of this batch. Second one is a, an episode called Elegy. Okay, so the episode called Elegy begins with this opening narration. The time is the day after tomorrow, the place, a far corner of the universe. The cast of characters, three men lost amongst the stars, three men sharing the common urgency of all men lost. They're looking for home. And in a moment, they'll find home, not a home that is a place to be seen, but a strange, unexplainable experience to be felt. Elegy is written by Charles Beaumont. There's a few Charles Beaumont ones in this little batch. Um, his stories are really, really clever. And this one is about three lost astronauts that are trying to find somewhere that they can call home because they are totally lost. They're in space and um, they definitely can't find Earth. They want to find something that they can settle on. And they find somewhere that's got the same gravity and atmosphere as Earth. And they're really pleased to find it. They get out of the ship and it's this is really weird town. And quite quickly they discover that there are lots of people, but all the people are absolutely still. They're like mannequins. And there's music uh, from a brass band and the brass band are just still while the music's being played. And it's, it's really eerie. It's really good. Um, but there's lots and lots of people but they're all motionless and uh, it's all very mysterious for a while. And then they meet this guy who explains what's going on. And again, it's quite a dark story, really, because the the um, secret to what's going on is not a happy thing. And it's not that they're dead. Uh, it's much more complex than that. And... Uh, yeah, it's it's a really nice story with a really interesting premise behind it. 
and um, quite a um, downbeat ending. So yeah, it was really, really effective. What's interesting as well is that they decided to not use mannequins and they used people that were instructed clearly to not move a muscle while the camera's on them. And by and large, they do that really well. But uh, yeah, you can see that there's people desperately trying to stay still while there's other people, like the three astronauts running around going, oh my God, what's happening? What is this strange place? So that was a bit of a risky move. But I think knowing what technology was like at the time, nowadays they'd put like CGI people in or and they'd do something else with it. But um, in those days, I think that's the best way to make that effective. So I do think it's effective and they look like real people. And they do need to look like real people because they are real people in the story. I won't tell you any more than that, but they are real people. But that was a really good one. Um, and another little nugget that I, I thought was really interesting. I recognised it straight away. Um, the music, sorry, not the music, the sound effect, the Foley sound effect from the original USS Enterprise, from the original series Star Trek, is in this episode when they're on the ship. It's got the same noise that you, you'd recognise if you were a Star Trek fan. So that was weird. <laughs> uh, the next one is called Mirror Image. And that's written by Rod Serling. And Mirror Image starts with this opening narration. Millicent Barnes, age 25, young woman, waiting for a bus on a rainy November night. Not a very imaginative type is Miss Barnes, not given to undue anxiety or fears, or for that matter, even the most temporal flights of fancy. Like most young career women, she has a generic classification as a, quote, girl with a head on her shoulders, end of quote. All of which is mentioned now because in just a moment, the head on Miss Barnes's shoulders will be put to a test. Circumstances will assault her sense of reality and a chain of nightmares will put her sanity on a block. Millicent Barnes, who in one minute will wonder if she's going mad. And this one is uh, a really um, atmospheric, paranoid episode that just ramps up the um, confusion of the main character, um, the, the sort of desperation of um, am I going mad kind of thing. And it's really cool because it, it, it the, the, the narrative kind of deviates in a way that you think, oh, maybe... Uh, is going over here and it goes over there and then another character becomes the main character for the last little bit the last little epilogue type thing in the episode and it's really good it's a really good episode and you're not really sure where it's going to go and it just basically plays out the premise of the of the thing so there's not really a twist as such in a way you could suggest that the twist is that there isn't one because what um what the woman keeps seeing is there um, and there's a man that's involved and he ends up uh, experiencing the same thing. And it's just, it's really cool. Um, and, and I think the last bit when the man is chasing this thing, which I won't tell you what it is, um, it's really, it's really um, effective. It looks really odd in a disturbing way. So, so yeah, Mirror Image is a, is a really good... Um, it's a really good episode. And apparently, it's that episode that inspired Jordan Peele to write Us. So I don't know if you know Jordan Peele. Um, he has actually got a relationship with Twilight Zone directly now because he presented the last version of the Twilight Zone. But... Um, uh, you can tell that Twilight Zone is in his work. So the three films he's directed um, are very Twilight Zone, uh, Twilight Zone influenced. But apparently this episode in particular influenced him on his second directorial film, Us, which is an amazing film. So he directed Get Out and then he directed Us and he directed Nope. And they're really good films. So yeah, that's really interesting. The next one in this little batch is called The Monsters Are Due on Maple Street. This is one of the really famous ones. And it's one of the really famous ones for a really good reason. It is phenomenal. It's an incredible episode. And the opening narration of The Monsters Are Due on Maple Street is this. Maple Street, USA, late summer, 
A tree-lined little road of front porch gliders, barbecues, the laughter of children and the bell of an ice cream vendor. At the sound of the roar and a flash of light, it would be precisely 6.43pm on Maple Street. This is Maple Street on a late Saturday afternoon, in the last calm and reflective moment before the monsters came. It's such a good episode. It's uh, one of the most powerful social commentary episodes. So um, now and again, Rod Serling would make comments about people, might make political comments, might make comments about the way we work and sort of like mob mentality, which is kind of what this one's about. And the sort of uh, the potential for nastiness and greed and selfishness and pettiness that comes in a lot with the, his stories. But this, this is such a cool idea because basically uh, a shadow goes over Maple Street and then there's this flash of light and people are like, oh, what happened there? And they kind of carry on, but then they can't carry on because all their electricity has gone and all their water has gone. They can't do anything in, in their town and they're all a bit freaked out by it. And they all come together in the middle of the street going, what's happening? What, uh, what's, why is everything stopped? And then one of the kids says... I read a comic uh, that said that uh, aliens would do this and uh, you, you can't do anything about it. It's like an invasion. And at first they're like, oh, well, what, you don't know anything. You're just a little kid with a comic. Uh, but then they start getting quite paranoid and they start turning on each other. And the way they turn on each other is one really realistic. It's done really well. It's written really well. It's really chilling. It's absolutely relevant now because you can see it now all the time. It's kind of got worse in some ways, but this commentary that, that is in this episode about the way that we act when we're panicking, when we feel like we're up against the wall and we um, just turn on our neighbours is absolutely fantastic. It really is a really important episode. I think if you think about the context of the time, I think it's commenting on McCarthyism and the Cold War, uh, but I do think it's more universal than that. It's talking about stuff that's still relevant now, and uh, I think it's just a fantastic episode. So Monsters are due on Maple Street. Brilliant, brilliant episode. Okay, so I don't normally do this for these episodes, but I'm going to read out the, um, the little bit of the final narration as well for this episode. So that goes, For the record, prejudices can kill and suspicion can destroy, and a thoughtless, frightened search for a scapegoat has a fallout all its own, for the children and the children yet unborn. And the pity of it is that these things cannot be confined to the Twilight Zone. Incredible writing. One of the best. And then uh, there's another episode next. The fifth one in this little batch is The World of Difference. Okay, so The World of Difference begins with this. Opening narration. You're looking at a tableau of reality, things of substance, of physical material, a desk, a window, a light. These things exist and have dimension. Now this is Arthur Curtis, age 36, who is also real. He has flesh and blood, muscle and mind. But in just a moment we will see how thin a line separates that which we assume to be real with that manufactured inside of a mind. Um, I can't even hear that phrase without thinking about um, the uh, the song that I wrote uh, with my son called A World of Difference, off the album World of Difference. All of the Bemis albums are actually named after episodes of The Twilight Zone. So inevitably, because we're named after Henry Bemis, the first episode was called, sorry, the first album was called Time Enough at Last. And our second to last album was called World of Difference. Um... But anyway, it's a great episode, absolutely brilliant episode, written by Richard Matheson. Um, and, I, you know, Richard Matheson is such a great writer. But what's interesting about this one is um, I've always I've, I've always been when the Truman Show came out, I resented the fact that there was no reference to um, inspired by or um, some sort of acknowledgement uh, of this episode. And I'm not suggesting that the people who, who wrote The Truman Show definitely had seen this episode, but The Twilight Zone is such a famous series 
I feel like it should have got some sort of acknowledgement in the credits. But basically, this is like the Truman Show. Uh, it's not. It's not exactly the same. Um, there's a um, a character who is playing um, a high executive, and he and he and they sort of shout cut, and he's like, "What?" And he doesn't realise that he's he, what he thinks is real life is a character, and uh, and it sort of plays out with this really confused man trying to insist to everybody that he's not who they say he is because they keep referring to him as the actor. It's a really good central performance. Howard Duff uh, did a great central performance in this in this episode. Really, really good. And uh, yeah, it's a brilliant episode. One of my favourites. And uh, there's kind of a bit of a mysterious ending. It suggests in the at the end that he somehow escapes this real identity. Uh, it's It's really quite vague. So... It's up for interpretation, definitely. But that's the suggestion, which I think is really interesting. So, yeah, brilliant episode. Again, really, really good one. These these are a nice little batch, this one. And the last one for this batch is, again, fantastic episode. Really, really, really good. And it's called Long Live Walter Jameson. And then Long Live Walter Jameson begins with this opening narration. You're looking at Act 1, Scene 1 of a Nightmare, one not restricted to witching hours of, or dark, rain-swept nights. Professor Walter Jameson, popular beyond words, who talks of the past as if it were the present, who conjures up the dead as if they were alive. In the view of this man, Professor Samuel Kittredge, Walter Jameson has access to knowledge that couldn't come out of a volume of history, but rather from a book on black magic, which is to say that this nightmare begins at noon. And Long Live Walter Jameson is written by Charles Beaumont again. And uh, it's basically two men in a room talking pretty much with a few interruptions. But it's a, it's a two-man play, if you like. And basically Walter Jameson is immortal. Um, played by Kevin McCarthy. So Kevin McCarthy is probably most famous for being the main character in the original version of The Invasion of the Body Snatchers, and he's brilliant in that. He's brilliant in this. And uh, what I find really interesting is that immortality in this episode is very subdued, reflective, downbeat, and almost something you don't want. And it, he's tired of it. He has accepted it, and, he's, and he says he can't end his life but he doesn't get ill and he doesn't die from old age and he's not, he doesn't change his appearance from old age. And there's this, there's this man that is the father of uh, his girlfriend or fiance who suspects that he might be immortal. And it's just a really, really, really good dialogue between the two of them. And uh, it, there's another character that comes into play who is basically uh, driving the narrative uh, in quite a dramatic way as well by the end of it. One of the interesting things about the episode as well is that, as far as I know, this, I think, is the first appearance of um, a makeup artist that does several fantastic jobs in The Twilight Zone called William Tuttle. And William Tuttle, is his makeup's brilliant. And there are a few uh, examples where the makeup has a really massive impact on the episode. And in this one, he's got to give... Um, He's got to give ageing makeup. I won't tell you why, because that will spoil the episode, but he's got to create ageing makeup. And uh, William Tuttle is absolutely brilliant. He's a really interesting makeup artist and uh, really has a huge contribution to The Twilight Zone. When I think about the big players of The Twilight Zone, William Tuttle's one of them. And uh, funnily enough, he does later on get uh, an Oscar for the makeup he does for The Seven Faces of Dr. Lau, which is a really interesting film starring Tony Randall. Um, and the script of that film was written by Charles Beaumont as well, which I think is a really interesting bit of symmetry there. So, so yeah, William Tuttle um, uh, makes his appearance in this one as a makeup artist. Later on, he does The Masks, which is just an insane uh, episode, but that's a lot later on. So there we are. Um, that's another batch of six episodes, really good ones. Some of my favourites are in this little batch. And uh, we're getting towards the end of 
season one. Um, but uh, yeah, phenomenal episodes. Let me know if you've seen those ones. Let me see if those um, uh, make you kind of interested to watch them. And uh, I'll see you next time. Stay curious, everybody. Thanks a lot. Bye. Like to